The case of the Idaho 4 killings is still ongoing with Brian C. Koberger as the main suspect in court. The four by name Ethan Chapin, Zana Kenodo, Madison Morgan and Kaylee Gonchalves lost their lives on the 13th of November 2022 when they were attacked by an unknown assailant at their residence 1122 King Road House in Moscow, Idaho as they slept. As it stands now, Brian C. Koberger, a PhD student studying criminology, has been cited as the key suspect with the case still in court. The other twist to this case, however, is that there were actually two survivors of this attack who are still alive and may be called upon to testify if need be. But a little has been said about the trauma they are probably enduring as a result of surviving Brian C. Koberger's attack on their friends. That is, if he is truly the killer in this case. This video is going to get into the story of these two survivors, what they are going through, the survivors' guilt they are feeling, and even how some members of the society seemed to be blaming one of the victims for not doing something early enough after discovering the gruesome killing of their friends. These two survivors had a brush with a bloodthirsty killer but their story is hardly discussed and I'm seeking to get into their side of things so that we begin to understand what they went through. These two survivors are namely Bethany Funk and Dylan Mortensen and they are the sole survivors of the bloodbath of the killing of the Idaho Four. They found their friends' bodies hours after the brutal attack in their off-campus home. Now, for the first seven weeks following the incident, preliminary investigations were reporting that Mortensen and Funk were actually asleep during the bloodbath attack. But then, further investigations went on to reveal that Dylan Mortensen actually came face to face with the killer just before he sneaked out of the house after he had finished with his wicked act. This sent chills down my spine because I tried to put myself in the shoes of this person, witnessing what has happened to her friends and seeing the person who allegedly did it face to face and the person passing you by and escaping. It, it leaves a feeling that you can't shake off and probably a trauma that will stay with you for the rest of your life. Now, the floor plans of the building actually show that Funk and Mortensen lived on the first floor of the split-level home, accessible by a door with a code lock. Now, the second and third floors where the four victims lived had been just assessed through a sliding glass door. Funk was a member of the Pi Beta Phi sorority with Kenodo and Morgan. Now, on the night of the murders, it is still not revealed at the time where Funk and Mortensen were in the hours before the killings, but it was later confirmed they got home just after 1 a.m. Now, the four victims had made their way back to the house by 2 a.m. So at least, as at that time, they were all in the house. The murder of these four people would eventually take place around 4 a.m. of that dawn. Now, according to police reports that was unsealed in court, Mortensen woke up around 4 a.m. after hearing voices. She reportedly thought she heard Gonchalves saying, there's someone here, and then crying from Kenodo's room. Mortensen opened her door to find a figure clad in black clothing and mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards her. 
Mortensen said she was shocked and froze in place. But then the man just walked past her and got out the back sliding glass door. Mortensen then locked herself in her room. Police never revealed the identity of the 911 caller at the time, but then they said the call came from one of the surviving roommate's phones. Investigators have also not revealed why the 11.58 a.m. phone call came nearly eight hours after Mortensen reportedly saw the killer inside her, her home. Investigators also said that Funk and Mortensen might be key to solving this crime and quickly ruled the two out as suspects. So, this was where we were at the time. Now, put yourself in the shoes of Mortensen especially because Funk didn't say anything about her seeing the killer or coming face to face with him. But Mortensen did. And if that is true, put yourself in her shoes. You would understand why she froze. But there is also the possibility at the time when the case was fresh that she could be lying and she could actually also be a suspect. Because how fortunate can you be that a man allegedly comes into your home, takes the life of four of your friends, and some way, somehow, he meets you face to face and just walks away. For some people who are a bit skeptical, it wouldn't make sense because the more likely thing a criminal in that regard would do is to also attempt to take your life as well because obviously you are a witness. You could give some form of description that could point to the police his way. So yes, the police needed to actually confirm that Mortensen and Funk are not suspects in this case and according to the police they have i don't know how they established that exactly but they are saying that they have then this case went to the next chapter where people or some people were wondering how come mortensen saw this alleged killer around 4 a.m but went to her room shut the door and only called the police around 11.55 or 58 a.m., which is almost about eight hours apart. What was she doing all this while? Why didn't she call early enough? And this is where the conversation also gets tricky because on one breath, Modernson is alleged to have said that she froze. And people are attributing that to the possibility of why she didn't call in time. But let's just go with that narrative and then get into the analysis about it. Saying that she froze. But if she froze, how is it that she's able to lock her door and also allegedly even called other people in the residence area just to check if they are fine? Did all that before calling the police. It's alleged that she called other people. I'm here to see anything to confirm that though. But even without that, assuming that she actually froze like she's saying, at least she had the wherewithal to be able to lock the door behind her. And I'm wondering how she couldn't just follow through with that to call 911. I am thinking that should have followed through instinctively. But then again, I haven't been in that situation before. So maybe all I'm saying is a bit theoretical. I'm not trying to blame them or anything. But then one would expect that at least when the coast was clear, you could have called 911. There's also no report about Mortensen or Funk even coming out to check on their friends, whether they were still alive or whether they could do something to help the situation. There is no report on that as well. So in the absence of that, it means that there was a gap of nearly eight hours between when Mortensen saw the killer leaving after taking the lives of her four friends and when she called 911. And all this while, her reports out there, she was locked up in her room. For me, not to blame her, but it doesn't make sense to me. 
but like again like i said i haven't been in that situation before but going with the the, the natural flow of common sense expected to play out in such situations i think that something is not adding up why do i say this i will explain so it is more understandable you lock yourself up the first instinct is to protect yourself so it makes sense she's locking herself up to protect herself the second instinct is to seek for help probably maybe she armed herself with a baseball bat or something that's not reported on but the next instinct would be to seek for help, to scream for help, to call for help. But if she froze to that extent, but then is alleged to have called other people before eventually ended up calling 911 about eight hours afterwards, then it means she had some level of self-awareness to do all these things. So I'm wondering how that didn't extend to just calling 911. I appreciate that she may not have the courage to try to open the door to go and check on her friends. That would take more courage to do. So I understand if she didn't have it or she was too traumatized or shocked to do that. But I think that shock in itself or that fear should have triggered the need to reach out for help through 911. I may be wrong. This is just one angle of an analysis I'm making just so we all get to appreciate how these things played out. But the eight-hour gap between when she allegedly met this killer and when she placed the 911 call has become a question that people are waiting for answers on. To the point that some people are even trying to blame her that she took too long in calling the police. The police cleared her as a, sus as, as a possible suspect, but that question still lingered on as to how come she couldn't make that call in time because maybe it could have made a difference although that has also not been established now with regards to funk for her she didn't even come out at all but the reports out there so she never met the alleged killer but she was still on the premises in her room on the ground floor so between these two Definitely, they will go through a lot of trauma. And I think Dylan Mortensen will suffer the trauma more than Funk, comparatively, because she allegedly even saw the person. That, that alone in itself is traumatizing enough. Not to talk of the fact that there are some people out there also trying to blame you for something. So in as much as you are grieving the loss of your friends and having to deal with the trauma associated with their passing, the manner in which they passed, the fact that you met the killer. You are also now saddled with some people's opinions about what you did wrong or what you seemingly did wrong. So it's, it's quite a lot to bear. And these things have a way of bringing people together. So it was not strange to me when Funk and Mortensen largely remained silent after the incident now they wrote some letters to their lost friends which were read out aloud by a pastor during a service or a vigil that was held in december for kenodo i would want to get into what the letter was saying just so we appreciate their trend of thoughts and how this affected them because a lot is not being said about what they are going through most of the publications and the stories out there are talking about the lives that have been lost. I respect that and RIP to them. And it's understandable too, but I think that someone needs to tell the story of Funk and Dylan Mortensen because what Bethany Funk and Dylan Mortensen went through is another thing in itself. I'm sure that some way, somehow, a part of them is dealing with survivor's guilt. If you don't know survivor's guilt, let me explain what it's about. Survivor's guilt kicks in when a group of people go through something or maybe more than one person goes through something and lives are lost, but at least one person survives. And then based on the conversation that plays out after the incident, the person that survived has to answer questions as though it's his or her fault that he or she survived. And the person begins to feel like, maybe I shouldn't have even survived. 
the person is begin the person begins to feel guilty just for surviving and I, I don't think that is fair on anybody now let's get into the details of the letters that bethany funk and dylan mortensen wrote in honor of their four friends who are now titled as the idaho four i'm quoting you always told me that everything happens for a reason and this was coming from funk and she wrote this talking about Morgan because Morgan was like her big sister, you know. And I continue. She said, you always told me that everything happens for a reason, but I'm, I'm having a really hard time trying to understand the reason for this. They changed the way I look at life. And this is coming from Martinson. They changed the way I look at life. My life was greatly impacted to have known these four beautiful people. My people who changed my life in so many ways and made me so happy. Now, you begin to understand the state of emotion of these two ladies. And excuse me a bit, I'll have to add that I hope it's a real emotion because mind you, this case is still ongoing. And when it comes to cases like this, you have to leave an open door somewhere which makes it tolerable that anything can happen. There could be twists and turns in the case. There could be something that will be found out later that changes the entire narrative of the case as we've known it since its occurrence in November 2022. So in as much as all these emotions are flying around, we also have to bear in mind that the case is actually in court and nobody has been prosecuted and found guilty of the murders yet. So it means that the murder is the murderer is still out there. That's notwithstanding. The two girls, Bethany Funk and Dylan Mortensen, appeared to have gotten matching tattoos to memorialize their fallen four friends. They linked the initials of the victims' names, getting MKXE on their arms along with angel wings. The MKXE is the abbreviation of the names of their four friends, namely Ethan, Zana, Madison, and Haley. I hope these guys are resting in peace, but I know they will rest in more peace when their killer or killers are found. As it stands now, the microscope is on Brian C. Koberger and his lawyer is also not sleeping around. His lawyer is doing everything in court to also defend her client. And like I said, everything plays out in court. It is now that the case is going to be dissected, evidences are going to be scrutinized, and eventually a verdict is going to be played out and until then the case remains unsolved although there's a suspect in custody there is still a potential or a slight potential that they may have gotten the wrong person although they believe they have the right person i'm not saying they don't i'm just saying that until the verdict is out the case remains inconclusive and it means that all chips are actually still on the table because just one new discovery can change the horizon in this case in which case everything that we've known or most of the things we've known to date could change i'm keeping my fingers crossed i'm following this case closely as and when updates are available i'll bring them to you but until then r.i.p to the victims in this case the idaho four I'm hoping that they will get justice after the court proceedings and investigations are thoroughly through. And to the surviving victims, Dylan Mortensen and Funk, I pray that they have the strength or they find the strength and they are given the support they need to go through this traumatic experience and come out of it better than they were because it could scar them for life traumatize them for life and maim them for life.
if not care is the if care is not properly properly taken until then you know what to do subscribe to the channel if you are yet to do so turn on post notifications leave a comment in the comment section and like our video we'll catch you next time